So hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Ongoi Mwangi. I'm a Kenyan Naren and I do videos on nursing education, patient teaching as well as health education. And this is a video on nursing education on ECG rhythms recognition. Quite lengthy but very informative. Uh, if it's your first time here, please take your time to subscribe and hit the bell icon so that you're notified every time I upload an informative video. And if you're a returning subscriber, know that I think they really appreciate you. So let's dive right in. So to introduce an ECG in full is called an electrocardiogram and usually is abbreviated either as EKG or ECG and this is a test that measures the electrical activity of the heartbeat. With each beat, an electrical impulse or wave travels through the heart. This wave causes the muscle to squeeze and pump out blood from the heart chambers. A normal heartbeat on ECG will show the timing of the top and lower chambers. The right and the left atria, or the upper chambers, will make the first wave called a pin. Following a flat line, when the electrical impulse goes to the bottom chambers. The right and the left bottom chambers, or the ventricles, make the next wave called a QRS complex. The final wave, or T wave, represents a electrical recovery or return to resting state for the ventricles. So why would one do an ECG or the indications of doing an ECG? One is to obtain baseline records. If it's your first time in hospital or attending a clinic, let's like say you're going to a cardiology clinic for the first time, they would like to see your ECG first before they can actually go ahead and try to treat you. Then to monitor and evaluate a patient's heart rate and breathing, to evaluate the extent of disease or injury to the heart function, to evaluate response of certain medications, uh, some medications will cause injury to the heart and some medications are meant to cause or to, to heal the heart. So basically it can compare the outcomes of certain medications uh, and that will be in the ECG. For example, in the oncology world we have some medications that will be so toxic to the heart or cardiotoxic and over time you will require to do ECGs just to evaluate if there is any loss of function or there is any a dysfunction of cardiac muscle after uh, treatment with these medications over time. Then, uh, for patients who have artificial pacemakers, it is used to evaluate the pacemaker function. So basically, that is the most important. Uh, those are the most important indications of the ECG. The location of the heart, uh, we can know it is always in the front and it is usually in the chest area, but it usually is more on the left side than on the right side. It goes directly onto the cardiac notch on the lungs. So the left lung usually has two lobes to allow for the space or the cardiac, the space called the cardiac notch where the heart comes and inserts itself. So there is those borders and it is protected from injury by the rib cage. So basically when you are doing, let's say, some a procedure like open heart surgery, you will have to go through the rib cage. So uh, my diagram I think is clear enough so we can move on to the next. To understand ECG rhythms, it is important to have a quick refresher or a quick reminder of how the blood flows through the heart chambers uh, because it is important while analyzing the ECG waves. So blood flows through the heart and lungs through four steps and the first step is the right atrium receives deoxygenated blood or oxygen poor blood from the body through the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Then it pumps this right into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. And when this is happening, that is when you hear the first heart sound, and that is lab. So the lab comes from the tricuspid and bicuspid valves opening and closing. So that is lab. Once uh, blood goes into the right ventricle, the right ventricle pumps the oxygen poor blood to the lung through the pulmonary, pulmonary valve. So again, this is where we get the second heart sound, which is lab. So we know we have two no more heart sounds, and the one is lab and the other one is lab. So lab dab, lab dab. That is how the heart sounds will will synchronize and will flow always and will sound. So uh, from the right atrium, uh, the left atrium will receive the oxygen-rich blood or oxygenated blood from the lungs and pumps it to the left ventricle with the mitral valve. So when the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve closes, that is when we get the lab. When the pulmonary valve and the aortic nerve close, that is when we get the dab. So those are the normal heart sounds. So the left ventricle pumps the oxygenated blood through the aortic valve 
to the rest of the body through the aorta. So here in these two diagrams, it's just the same thing we have talked about and it's about the blood flow of the human heart and you can see the superior and inferior vena cava bring blood back to the right atrium and that is a chamber that receives the deoxygenated blood from the rest of the body. From this chamber, again this blood goes to the right ventricle, quite is pumped out to the lungs, deoxygenated blood to the lungs goes to the pulmonary artery. So once it gets to the lungs, it is oxygenated and then comes back into the heart through the left atrium. The left atrium will pump it through to the right, to the left ventricle and then it is pumped out through the aorta to the rest of the body. So basically it is just about the way the blood will flow through the head chambers in and out to the lungs and to the rest of the body and then it comes back to the heart. Another important lesson to refresh on when you, you, you want to understand the diversity of ECGs is about the cardiac cells themselves and how they operate and those are the properties. So the properties of cardiac cells include the diversity or the ability to beat regularly. It never takes a, a break. Once it takes a break, then you're either in cardiac arrest or you're dead. Uh, automaticity, this is the ability of the heart to generate impulses without external stimuli. Excitability, the ability of cardiac cells to generate an action potential at its membrane in response to depolarization and to transmit an impulse along the membrane. Then we have contractility and this is the innate ability of the heart muscle to contract. Because when it is contracting or when they are depolarizing, then we get a squeeze and blood is pumped out of the chamber that has the blood at that point. Then we have conductivity, and this is the electrical conduction system that controls the heart rate. Then we have refractoriness, and this is the period in which no stimulus, no matter how strong, can cause an electric blood pressure. Because we remember there, in the action potential, we have three main processes. We have polarization, depolarization, and then repolarization. When it comes to polarization, the heart muscles, the heart cells are actually at rest. So that is the resting potential because and the ions will be controlled well and will be separated adequately by the membrane of the or the cardiac membrane. Then we have depolarization and this is the action or where there is contractility or there is contraction of these muscles and this is what pushes blood out of that heart chamber. Then we have repolarization and this is when the heart muscles are returning to the normal resting place. So going back to polarization. So it is important to remember that and it is because of these properties that of the cardiac cells that this action potential is actually able to do those three processes that I have Just that they have explained about the action potential is that when the cardiac cells are considered at rest, they are polarized, meaning no electrical activity takes place. The cell membrane of the cardiac muscle separates different concentrations of ions such as sodium, potassium and calcium and this is called the resting potential. Then we have the next process that is called depolarization and this is when electrical impulses are generated by automaticity of the specialized cardiac cells and once these electrical cells generate the electrical impulse, this electrical impulse causes the ions to cross through the cell membranes and causes an action potential. Depolarization is a movement of ions across the cell membrane such as sodium, potassium and calcium channels and this is a drive that causes contraction of the cardiac cells or the cardiac muscle. So depolarization with the corresponding contraction of myocardial muscle moves as a wave through the heart. So this is a point where there is action, where the heart is actually doing the pumping. You see that one of the functions of the heart is to pump blood out of the heart to the rest of the body. So this is at that point that this happens. So the last process I would like to discuss with the actual potential is the depolarization, and this is the return of the ions to their previous resting place or state, and this corresponds with the relaxation of the myocardium or the myocardial muscle. Depolarization and depolarization are electrical activities which cause muscular activity. The action potential curve shows the electrical changes in the myocardial cells during depolarization depolarization cycle. 
this electrical activity is what is dictated to all the ECG and not the muscular activities. So ECG is all about the electricity because we say the heart has both electricity and mechanical activity or the electrical impulses and the mechanical impulses. So when it comes to the ECG, we are basically concentrating on the electrical impulses. The point of depolarization and repolarization is quite significant when it comes to interpreting the ECGs. It is important for me to emphasize more on what is happening for us to get a clearer picture. So during depolarization, this is when cardiac muscles are stimulated or there is cardiac cell stimulation. On the other side, when there is repolarization, there is the relaxation of the cardiac muscles. On the depolarization side, the muscles contract while on the repolarization side of things, the muscles will be in the resting space or state. On the depolarization side, once an electrical cell generates electrical impulses, the electrical impulses causes the ion to cross the, the cell membrane causing an action potential. So the, the inside of the cell will become more positive. While during depolarization, it is the return of the ions to the previous state or resting state which corresponds to the inside of the cells becoming less positive and this corresponds with the relaxation of the myocardium. So again, before we get into the fun stuff about ECGs, it is important to understand the electrophysiology of the heart and the most important way how these electrical impulses will flow. It is important to remember that the sinoatrial node, this point here in the right atrium, that is where the pace starts or the electrical impulses will start being generated. So the sinoatrial node fires and this communicates or goes to the atrioventricular node. From this atrioventricular node again, it goes through the bundle of his through the two branches of the bundle of his, the right br bundle branch and the left bundle branch, ending up to the Purkinje fibers or the terminal Purkinje fibers. And these fibers act as the last, uh, the last line in terms of pacemaking. So the sinoatrial node will fire at a rate of between 60 to 80 beats per minute. While the atrioventricular node is known as the back hub pacemaker, and this fires at between 40 to 60 beats per minute. While the Purkinje fibers, since these are the terminal or the last result when it comes to pacemaking of the normal heart rhythm, then these ones will be firing at a pace of between 20 to 40 beats per minute. So uh, the most important thing is to remember that sinoatrial node is where the electrical impulses are originate from or where they will be fired from in the first place. So anything that is within the normal range, the normal rhythm, the normal everything will have a term sinus. The normal sinus rhythm means it is coming from the sinus, the sinoatrial node. So that is where that term comes from. Then you can also have normal sinus bradycardia and normal sinus tachycardia. So yes, it is being fired or the impulse is being generated by the sinoatrial node and the communication is happening. But then something is lost somewhere in translation in the process, creating either a bradycardia or a tachycardia. So bradycardia is when the heart rate is below 60 beats per minute, while tachycardia is when the heart rate is above 100 beats per minute. So on my diagram here is an introduction to ECG waves and I had said uh, these waves correspond to the electrical activity of the heart from the four chambers. So the first wave right here we have the P wave and it is usually smooth and curved. This wave shows or indicates the activity or the contractility or the depolarization of the atria. Since we have two atria, the left and the right, uh, when they are both contracting, that is when we get the P wave. Then from the P, we go to the Q wave, and the whole QRS, that complex, is about the ventricular depolarization or the contraction. So this is when blood is being pumped out of the out of the heart, either through the pulmonary valve or through the aortic valve. So that is when we get the QRS complex. Then we do have the T 
and this T wave is about the relaxation or repolarization of the ventricles. So it is important to know why we are getting this. So the another thing you need to know is that P waves are usually between three small boxes. So you remember uh, the ECG comes on a graphical representation, it is on a graph paper and there are small boxes and big boxes within this graph graphical representation. So the P wave should not exceed three small boxes. While the QRS complex again should not exceed three boxes. So it should be below there. So it should be between uh, 0.12 milliseconds. While the QRS complex as well is within the same normal range. However, there is an interval that is very, very important to take care of or to actually remember, and that is the PR interval. That is where the P begins or the PF begins and where the QRS complex begins or the R begins. So this PR interval should not exceed five small boxes and should not be below three small boxes. So the normal range is between that this interval is between three small boxes to five small boxes or 0.12 seconds to 0.22 seconds so when it comes to the r the r wave is at the peak of the qrs complex and that is what you use to calculate your rate your heart rate in in the cg so basically it is important to know that because from the first R to the next R wave should be telling you how regular that rhythm is and how on what is the rate of that client. So we continue. Another important thing is that from the S we have the ST segment and ST segment is important because it is vital while looking at patients with ST elevation or myocardial infarction. When there is myocardial infarction, this segment, the ST segment, will be elevated or depressed. So it is important to note what is happening to each of the segments. So usually it is just that and then the whole wave will keep repeating itself. Because this video is about ECG rhythm recognition, I'm going to give a five point criteria of how to recognize any ECG strip or any ECG rhythm given at any given time. Uh, I know on my list I have eight on this side, but I only want you to start with the first five. The first five points are what you will base your analysis on and you will be able to tell any um, ECG rhythm from any photo for as long as you have these five things at your fingertips. The first one is about the rhythm. So you have to know is this rhythm regular or irregular? So that is it. Once you're able to tell that, and I said this you will know from your RR interval. From the first R wave to the next R wave. Do we even have these R waves? Of course, if there is a QRS complex, there is an R wave. So you will be comparing those complexes to know the rate. Then you calculate the rate, and I had said again, you calculate the rate based on the R segment. There are three ways to calculate the rate, and I will show you those three ways. And I think the easiest and the most accurate one is about the small boxes. That is why I keep mentioning the small boxes. Then we have the P wave. The P wave is always smooth and curved. So if you see something that looks like the tooth of a saw, that is not smooth and curved. So that should indicate an issue. You should actually tell that there's a problem somewhere, right there, and that problem will be coming from the atria because we had said the P wave is about the squeeze or the contractility of the atrium. So then uh, when there is a P wave, a P wave should always be followed by a QRS complex. So if you find a rhythm that has Q P waves but no QRS complex, then that should tell you there's a problem. Then there is the PR interval. For as long as you have a P wave and then there's a QRS interval, you should be able to calculate the PR interval. So if it is possible for you to do that, if there's a PR interval and you're able to determine how long it is, you could be able to tell if it is normal, is it prolonged or is it shortened. So different measurement will mean different things. So it is important, but I will touch on this. I will expound on this further. Don't worry about it. The last criteria on criteria number five or the step number five is the QRS complex. 
So yes, the QRS complex I said is about the squeeze or the depolarization of the ventricles. So if there's an anomaly or if it is too wide or too narrow, you should be able to know that there is an issue somewhere. When there's a narrow QRS complex, that indicates a problem that is originating either from the atrium or above the ventricles. But if there is a wide QRS interval, then this is definitely coming from the ventricle side. So basically, with those five steps, you should be able to interpret any ECG. However, I would like you to note about the T and the ST interval because when you have that segment, if that segment is elevated or depressed, that could indicate the presence of myocardial infarction or uh, acute coronary syndrome. So it's an important segment as well. But when it comes to day-to-day -day analysis of ECG strips, then the first five should suffice. So the patient's rhythm or the rhythm on the ECG strip, you should, it can either be regular or irregular, and you'll be able to determine this by checking the RR interval. So the, the rhythm, the irregular rhythms can either be regular, regularly irregular, or a recurrent pattern of irregularity, or completely disorganized, which is irregularly irregular. Mark out several consecutive RR intervals on a piece of paper, then move them along the rhythm strip to check if the subsequent intervals are similar. So that will tell you what kind of irregularity or regularity that is on that strip. So from this strip that we can see here, we have a heart rhythm and what you need to know when I'm, I was talking about the small boxes, you can see from this graph there is the big boxes that has darker lines and then there is a small small boxes in. The next thing you need to know is that small five small boxes across will make a bigger box. Then five across, five above. So the bigger box is about small, 25 small boxes. But that is not the most important part. So uh, the most important thing is to actually remember about the small boxes. Because when you're determining whether the rhythm is regular or irregular, from our heart rate up here, you will see the small squares. So you just need to look at the R wave. So if you come here at the first R wave, you'd count the small boxes in between the, before the next R wave appears. So you can see from my diagram, we have nine small boxes on the first between the first RR. Then the second RR interval, there's 13 small squares. Then we have 12 small squares, 10 small squares, 10 small squares, 11 small squares, eight small squares, then 11 small squares. This tells you that this rhythm is not regular. Basically, that is how you tell whether the rhythm is regular or irregular. So again, if you look at how this is firing, are you able to see the P wave? Is it there? Is it, smart? Is, is it within the normal morphology? Is it smooth and curved? If the answer is no, then you know there is an issue with it, the atrium. So from this diagram, you can be able to tell this is an atrial fibrillation. So basically, this is how an atrial fibrillation will look like. The rhythm is irregular and the P wave is consistently not seen. It is hidden in within the T, T wave and you can see there. But the QRS complex remains. The next step in determining the rhythm or recognizing an ECG rhythm, I talked about rate. And rate you calculate based on what is on your ECG strip. So from the my diagram here, I don't have the small boxes, but I have the large boxes. This is on the graph. So within the large boxes, I can be able to tell how this is. And I can see my R. Uh, there are three ways of calculating the rate or the heart rate from an ECG. So looking at this, we have how many are QRS complexes? So you just count the QRS complexes and multiply that number by 10. That is one way. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 9 you multiply by 10, that gives you 90. So 90 is within the normal range. So this is a normal heart rate. There is no bradyol or tachycardia. So another method is looking at the big boxes. Uh, the one thing I have summarized for you is that uh, for every 300 big boxes, is equivalent to, six, to 60 seconds. And since the heart rate is measured in beats per minute, and one minute is 60 seconds, you get where I'm going with this? So every 300 box will represent a minute. 
So to know the height of this patient, what you're going to do, you're going to calculate how many big boxes are between from one R, R, one R interval to the next R interval. And from this, because it's a regular uh, rate, and we had seen this, we'll just calculate it from one R, R, and you can see there are four small, bo four large boxes in between the two R's. So you'll take 300 divided by four, and this gives you five, 75 bits per minute, which is a normal heart rate. If we had the small squares, 1500 small squares are equal to 60 seconds. So, assuming that uh, my four uh, large squares are equivalent to 4 times 5, which is 20, I would have taken uh, 1500 uh, small squares divided by 20, and that would give us what? Around the same number. So, basically, uh, it would have given us around 75. So the most accurate method I have seen is the small squares, but you will see that even the small boxes and the larger boxes give you a similar and almost uh, common or uh, same outcome when it comes to calculating the rate. When you use the calculation of every QRS complex multiplied by 10, sometimes it's not as accurate, but it will give you still a normal answer or an answer within the same range as the rest. In this slide, we have the different ways of calculating the heart rate on the ECG, and it is as I had explained, but again, it is very important to see it really. And the first method is about the small squares, where you divide on the number of small boxes between the R R interval. While the second method is about the big squares or the big boxes, and there are 300 big boxes for every 60 seconds or for every one minute, so you divide by the number of big boxes between the R R interval. Then we have, you can count the number of QRS complexes and multiply that number by 10, simply so. So the third criteria is about analyzing the P wave, and the one thing you need to keep reminding yourself is the P wave present, and is it of normal morphology? Is it smooth and curved? Does each P wave appear before a QRS complex? And what is the morphology of this P wave? And then is it within the normal range or the size? Is it within three small squares or narrower? That is how it should be. So findings, if it is a sawtooth baseline, those are flatter waves. If it is chaotic baseline, it is fibrillation waves. And then if it's a flat line, no arterial activity at all, then that is also a thing that you need to know because it will be in a wave called a systole. Then we have, if the P waves are absent and if there is a regular, irregular rhythm, that may suggest a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation. So basically, if you can't be able to see the P wave or it is not on the normal shape, then you need to know what kind of rhythm you are dealing with. So we have got it repeat stuff, guys. So the next thing you do to analyze the ECGs is about the PR interval and a PR interval should be between 120 to 200 milliseconds or between 3 to 5 small squares. So a prolonged interval suggests the presence of atrial ventricular blocks or it could also suggest the presence of a bradycardia. But usually if it's sinus bradycardia there will be no changes in the PR interval. So basically a first degree heart block involves fixed prolonged PR interval. Then, second degree type 1, also known as morbid type 1, uh, for, uh, includes progressive prolongation of the PRM, PR interval, and eventually an arterial impulse is not conducted and the QRS complex is dropped. So there's a place you will just find the P, then the P, meaning there is no QR complex in between. Then the second degree uh, block, or type 2, is also also known as morbid type 2 includes persistent or consistent PR interval duration with intermittently dropped QRS complexes due to failure of conduction. So the third degree com or complete atrioventricular block occurs when there is no electrical communication between the atria and the ventricles. This is due to a complete failure of conduction. 
So what happens is you will have your ECGs and you will have your P waves and your QRS complexes, but they are not even related. They don't look like they appear or they are coming from the same heart because they have no association with each other due to the arteries and the ventricles functioning independently. Usually there is a synchronization of how the atria communicates, like when I'm saying about the lab and the dub. The dub is produced when the blood is moving into the ventricles from the atria. And then the dub appears when the blood is moving out of the ventricles, out from the heart to either the lungs or the rest of the body. So lab dub. When that association is not there, you will have your P waves, lab, and then you pause, then you get your dub. So there will be abnormal heart sounds. That is exactly what I am trying to explain. That is why it was important to actually learn about the morphology and anatomy and electrophysiology of the heart in the first place. Because most of us are visual learners, it is important before I move to the next criteria to just highlight a few of these heart ventricular blocks set in the first degree heart block. So you can see there is a normal PR interval. However, there is what is happening around here. You can see the blocked area and this rhythm is not regular. So the PR interval is quite important because when we have um, the first degree heart block, there is a prolongation of the PR interval. So it is above five small squares. So second degree heart block or morbid stage two is what is shown here. We have said that there is a prolongation of the PR interval until at some point the QRLS will be dropped. So you see we started with a long or a prolonged four small squares. Remember it should be three to four. This is within normal. Then it goes to six small squares which is now prolonged and then the next cycle we, it is so prolonged that we do not have a QRS complex. So there is a dropped QRS complex. When you see this dropped QRS complex it should always tell you it's a second degree heart block no bits like one because that is where it goes Prolonging, prolonging, then it drops a QRS complex. The next wave, or what we have here, is morbid type 2 or second degree heart block morbid type 2. And in this case, we have consistent uh, PR interval. However, there we have these dropped QRS complexes. So you can see there is no QRS complex, there is no QRS complex, there is no QRS complex, there is no QRS complex. And in this category one on this one here, uh, you can see even these waves are inverted. The QRS is not the normal way, it is not above, it is on the bottom side. So this is a typical morbid type 2. Finally, we have a third degree heart block, and in another degree degree heart block, we said it is complete lack of conduction, meaning both the P's or the atria are firing on differently and the ventricles are firing differently and that is uh, present and comprehensively apparent on this, uh, what we can see here, because you will see a QRS complex, then a P wave, then another P wave, then another QRS complex. They are not related, they are just there. Then again, the atrias fires and there is a, Q, a P wave. After some time, there is a QRS complex. After some time, there is another P wave, P wave, QRS complex. So this shows the complete dissociation between the atria and the ventricular activity, which is called a third degree heart block, which means something should be done in first before this patient goes into cardiac arrest. So another, some tips that I can say about removing the heart blocks is that the first AV block occurs between the SA node and the AV node, that is within the atrium. So the, SA, the SAN is firing and remember this is the natural pacemaker of the body. So if there is a, a miscommunication between the SAN and the AVN, this is when we get the first block or the first degree after ventricular block. The second degree atrioventricular block morbid type 1 occurs in the AVN itself and that is where there will be a bit of conductivity in the heart but then it will be conducting at different speeds. Well type 2 will occur after the AVN and this will be in the, either in the bundle of his or its branches or in the Purkinje fibers. For a third degree AV block occurs at or after the AV load resulting in a complete blockage of the distal conduction. So it won't even get the bundle of this at all. 
criteria of analyzing ECG rhythms is about recognizing the QRS complex and what is most important is to tell whether it is narrowed or broad or wide. Because when we have narrow QRS complex, the malfunction could be coming either from the atrium or the above the ventricles. So narrow QRS is below small, three small boxes or less than 0.12 seconds. While wide or broad QRS complex is above five small boxes or above 0.12 seconds. So basically, a narrow QRS complex occurs when the impulse is conducted down to the bundle of his and the package of fibers to the ventricles. This results in a well-organized synchronized ventricular depolarization. So the cause in this case then will be atrio or above the ventricles. While a broad QRS complex occurs if there is an abnormal depolarization sequence, for example, a ventricular ectopic where the impulse spreads slowly across the myocardium from the focus in the ventricle. In contrast, a natural ectopic would result in a narrow QRS complex because it would conduct down the normal conduction system of the heart. Similarly, a bundle of branch block results in a broad QRS complex because the impulse gets to the ventricle rapidly down the intrinsic conduction system, then has to spread slowly across the myocardium to the other ventricles. So basically, narrow QRS is either from the atria or above the ventricles, while the broad or the wide QRS complexes definitely are coming from the ventricular side of things. So we are getting into the good stuff, the good and interesting stuff. So you can see from my table there and from my slides, we have a normal heartbeat, a fast heartbeat, a slow heartbeat, and a regular heartbeat. So the first three are coming from the sinus, and the first one is a normal sinus treatment. While the second one is a normal sinus tachycardia. And the third one is a normal sinus bradycardia. And that you can tell because they are regular. But when it comes to the tachycardia, it is too fast, or the spaces between the R intervals are quite narrow. While when it comes to the sinus bradycardia, there is a, an increased RR interval. But still, it is within normal sinus bradycardia. While the next diagram there is a diagram showing atrial fibrillation where there is an irregular heartbeat, an irregular rhythm, and the PR interval is hard to determine and we are not able to even tell where the P wave is. Sometimes it is hidden. So that is an irregular rhythm. So basically what you can see, now we have the action of the atria, that is the P wave, the action of the ventricles in the QRS complex, and the recovery of the ventricular contraction, which is depicted in the T wave. I will give examples of different kinds of rhythm. I will not go to the details because we have done a thorough five-step analysis. And if you use that analysis, you can be able to tell that what we have here on this graph is a sinus bradycardia. Because yes, it is regular, however, we have different or uh, a very large RR interval. So that is a sinus bradycardia. So then we have a sinus tachycardia, and a sinus tachycardia occurs because there is a normal rhythm. The rate is very fast because if you count this and you multiply that by 10, that will have above 100 beats, definitely, so that is a tachy. The P waves are partially hidden, so we are not able to calculate the PR interval. And the QRS is narrowed, or within the normal range, it is about 0.8 seconds if you are able to calculate that. And this tells you this is a normal sinus tachycardia, basically. So on this slide, we have atrial fibrillation, and this is an irregular rhythm. If you are starting from the rhythm, the rhythm is regular. And then the other thing we need to go to determine where the P wave is. It is there, it is not of normal morphology. And as you can see here, the atriums are just firing at will in a disorganized haphazard manner. And this is very characteristic of a fibrillation. So this is a tachycardia, and this is a tachycardia that is over a narrow QRS complex, as you can see, and it's a natural fibrillation. So from my diagram here of this ECG strip, we can be able to see we have the QRS complex that is narrowed. However, we are not able to tell apart the 
other waves you are not able to tell whether we have a p wave whether we have a t wave because everything looks like so tooth and this is characteristic of flatter and this, since we said remember we are going from the rhythm to the rhythm is regular however the rate is quite rapid so this is a definitely a tacky uh, when it comes to the P and the PR interval, we are not able to determine properly because we cannot be able to actually count because something is getting lost somewhere in that conduction system. Then the QRS complex is definitely, definitely narrowed. So this is a, a narrow regular sinus tachy. Sorry, a, a, a narrow regular tachycardia. So when you'll be managing this, you'll be managing based on whether the patient is stable or unstable. So this is a natural flutter and it's very characteristic. So from this diagram, we have a supraventricular tachycardia. Remember we said anything that is narrowed, will have a narrow QRS complex. You can see from the rhythm, the rhythm is regular, the rate is very rapid because even if you count these QRS complexes and you multiply by 10, you get a rate of above 100 and 50 then if you look at the p wave and the t wave you are not able to tell them apart and this is characteristic of the supraventricular tachycardia so it is a regular rhythm yes however it is a tachy and it is a narrow qrs complex wave so this is characteristic of supraventricular tachycardia so now going again from our criteria remember we said rhythm the rhythm here is regular you can see that the rate is quite rapid therefore we have a tachycardia if you're able to regulate those small boxes you'll be able to get a rate of above 120 beats per minute then from the p and the s you cannot be able to tell the p wave where the p wave is you cannot be able to tell where the t wave is so it is hard to determine the pr interval however this is a wide angle or wide qrs complex therefore we know it is coming from the ventricular side and therefore this is a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia so again on this three thing we have a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and how do i know this the first thing that makes me know this is that we have an irregular rhythm the rate is quite high and fast and this is above 150 beats per minute the next thing that tells me this we are not able to identify the p wave and therefore we cannot determine how long or short the pr interval is and finally the qrs is wide and therefore this is coming from the ventricular side and therefore it's a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia another characteristic of this wave is that different segments look alike but they are different from each other segments so you can see from the far side to the the side to the center side and to the last part they are quite different from each other but this is a, a polymorphic ventricular tachy so finally we have a wide complex tachycardia of uncertain type and this is just haphazard there is a bit you can see like a polymorphic that some sections look like <laughs> ventricular fibrillation some parts will look like monomorphic uh, ventricular tachy but this is basically a wide QRS complex coming from the ventricular side and it's a tachycardia because the rate is above 150 and therefore this is a wide complex tachycardia of uncertain type using our five step. So thank you so much for watching through this video and learning with me when it comes to ECG recognition. So I hope you have the five steps within you, you, have, you can remember them at your fingertip. Remember we start by identifying the rhythm, whether it is regular or irregular. Then we check at the rate and this is where we calculate the heart rate based on either the small squares, the big squares or the QRS complexes. Then the third thing is about the P wave, whether it is present, whether it is of normal morphology and whether it is followed by a QRS complex. Finally, then we have the PR interval and this is you calculate from where the P starts and where the R starts and if you can be able to tell the PR interval you can be able to describe that rhythm and finally we have the QRS complex and this is about whether it is wide or narrow because we know if it's a narrow QRS complex that problem will be coming from the atrio or above the ventricles while if it's a wide QRS then again this comes from the ventricular side. So again, from my table, I always say, seek or and you shall find. And uh, healthcare seeking behavior has improved over time. And I tend to think you should be intentional about your health seeking behavior because it is your health and you serve nothing but the best. However, you're responsible for getting yourself that best here in Kenya. 
and that is how things are so until we see each other again in another video goodbye and ciao